Hey everybody, JJ here, back again with another Saturday of Zoom Networking. Our guest speaker today is absolutely amazing young lady. She's out of Pace Morby's Sub2 community. Um, one of the r- rising, rising rock stars in Sub2. If you've heard me on my calls before, you've heard me talk about Pace. He's the creative finance genius in the world today. And his Sub2 community is by far unparalleled as the best real estate education platform in the country. There's so many phenomenal people out of that community. And Liz is, is one of those folks. So Liz, you know, let me introduce my good friend, Liz Lopez. Liz, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. Thanks for having me on today. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Hey, I wanted to ask you, for those that don't know you, where in the country are you located? I'm in Arizona. I'm originally, I was born in Mexico, originally from New Jersey, though. I grew up in New Jersey, and I've been out here in Arizona about 28 years now. I could, I hear the New Jersey accent. Really? No, I'm Most kidding. I can't tell that I'm from New Jersey. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Maybe just a little bit. <laughs> I'm kidding. Hey, so um, we've obviously met through Sub2, which is a phenomenal community. And I've just seen you, you know, seeing your content, see what you're talking about. And your your topic today is, I think, very, very cool. And your topic is DSCR loans. Mm-hmm. We've got some new investors on the call and on YouTube. We're going to have people watching weeks and months later, some brand new investors. For those that aren't aware, what is a DSCR loan? Well, it stands for debt service coverage ratio. It's only an investment property loan. And Basically, it, the theme of it is: Does your cash flow cover your mortgage payment? So, say your rental income is a thousand, your mortgage payment all in—that's principal, interest, taxes, insurance. If you have flood insurance, um, if you have uh, HOA, so your total mortgage payment, if it equals your rental payment, that would be a one-to-one ratio, is what they say out there. There's some misconceptions though, because people think you have to have a 1.25 ratio to get one of these loans. I have no ratio loans or low ratio loans. So basically I can get you done if, even if it doesn't cash flow. Now keep in mind when that happens, your loan to value is going to be limited and the interest rate is going to be higher. Wow. Wow, th- this is a great topic. I can't wait to get in the meat and potatoes on this one. Hey, but really quick before we get going, I want to talk about Liz a little bit. Um, you know, we all get started in real estate a different way at different times. Some of us get started early. Some of us get started later on. Some become a landlord, like me. I was a landlord before I became an investor. Some become investors before they become landlords. Uh, you know, we get started at different times. It is our progression into being an adult. You know, we're, we're driving at 16, voting at 18. We're able to buy an alcoholic beverage at 21. Um for yourself in those years of those developmental years of I'll say adulthood or whatever, was real estate in the landscape for you? Was it something you, you saw? And if not, what were you doing say from your teens into your twenties? Trying to figure things out, getting in trouble. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I grew up late. I am, um, I was bartender for 18 years on and off. I got into real estate uh, 19 years ago this year, be 19 years uh, in mortgages. So I started out in mortgages. Um, I've done everything in mortgage. I started as a loan officer. I was a processor. I was an underwriter for 12 years, conventional FHA, VA underwriter. I was a branch operations manager for Fairway. I managed an income team. So we did income on every loan that came in. So I am an expert at calculating mortgage income. Um, I think one of my strengths with helping my investors is, you know, I get a loan approval. I don't just say, okay, get everything and we run with it. I fight those conditions. Because those underwriters, they put feel good conditions on there. There's other conditions that there's alternatives that we can use for conditions. So I, I fight tooth and nail for my loans for my people. Well, good for you. You know, it's um, you're you're just impressive from the, from the time I first spoke to you. Uh, you're just dynamic, and I I love your your energy and your your uh, just your approach is is awesome. Um, so you've been in the game for for a minute, as they say. Uh, when did you come across Sub Two? How did you how did you meet Pace? Yeah, so I got into real estate investing about six years ago. I was in um, NVREA. They taught us to flip virtually, so I was flipping homes from Arizona in Houston, Texas, which was quite the challenge. I made a lot of mistakes. I have a lot of uh, horror stories that, that I can tell you guys. But you know, our our failures make us better in this business, right? 
Um, and then I got into stuff too about three years ago. Um, I got kicked out today though, because my name was mortgage broker. So I had to take that off of my name for them to put me back in the group. I guess they're, uh, they're going through everybody, taking them out. They're, they have a, you have a business page. So um, I've been a sub two about three years now. I'm also um, in the science of flipping. That's Justin Colby. I'm one of the uh, the leaders of the women's coaching call. And uh, so, yeah, I love sub two. I love to meet people, love to network, and love to connect. This sounds fantastic. Kate Sansone, you're on with Liz Lopez. What's your question? Hi, JJ. Hi, Liz. Um I'm looking at a property right now, and they are people that basically have made a phenomenal destination, uh, Airbnb type thing. It is units on a five acre property. And when they're sending me all the information, what they're sending me is negative because of the cost that they are paying, because they're still paying off the their park model of uh, manufactured homes. They're they're paying them off. They're paying uh, furniture de deals off, that kind of thing. So my question is, if I get from them their information about what they are actually getting for the home as like their rent rolls, I guess, as Airbnb, uh, would that be considered for a DSCR loan? Because when they, what the total price is, they're paying off all the things that they're deducting, that they're paying along the way. For example, Aaron's furniture, they're paying them off. I, I know that's a basic one, but they could make, so they're showing negative 36,000 for that particular model when actually they've made 80,000 that particular model but they've been paying things. How would a DSCR lender look at something like this? Did you say it's a single family home or what kind of property is it? It is, um, it's a destination rental place. It's five acres, has 22 bungalows on it. And- uh, Okay, so it's a multi-unit type of thing. Okay. Right. Yes. Is it worth looking into? Would DSCR even consider someone like that if they see the income they're making? If it covers the amount of the the amount of the property, but everything they're sending me is negative numbers because they're paying off different things on the property because they're a startup. So when you're saying bungalows, are they all like single family homes that are in this community? Yes, they have five okay. acres and it is 22 different park model type homes. And actually some of them were sold off, but they're willing, to, it's included in the price to purchase all of them. So we're, when it comes to DSCR and especially if we're looking at it single family, that sounds like something we would look at like a blanket DSCR loan. So there's only certain lenders that'll do blankets, meaning... They'll cover more than one property at, at a time. We're strictly just going to be looking at the rental, the rental payment, rental income, excuse me, versus the mortgage payment. Perfect. And for that short-term rental, so there are only certain lenders that will, will, uh, will do short-term rental calculations versus long-term, long-term rents. So yes, we they if it hasn't been a short-term rental, they will look at the air DNA. And there's a, a link on there, projected income. That's what lenders will look at. But if it's been a short-term rental in the past, we're going to do a 12-month look back of what they have received in income. But no, we're not. For blanket DSCRs, unless we're getting into more of a commercial multi-unit, then some lenders will add in the expenses. What are the annual expenses? They'll add that into the DSCR ratio. But for just a typical single-family or a blanket, we're not going to add in expenses. We're just going to be looking at the, the payment versus the rental income. Okay, and the amount they're asking is going to pay off all of the loans. So what you want to know is what you're, they're actually getting and if it can substantiate the loan payment. That, I don't, I mean, that's, 
that's their problem. They're going to have to, you know, what are they selling the house for? That's what we care about. What's the rental income? If they don't have the money to pay off their loans, they're going to have to find it somewhere. I'm not, we don't, we don't care about that piece about the seller. Okay. Well, that's perfect because the amount that they're asking is going to pay off all of their debt. And so what's left, you'll look at what they're actually receiving and that the loan payments could be made by what they're actually receiving. Right. Because you're the new buyer. Yes. So we're looking at you taking over these properties. What are, What's the mortgage payment going to be for you? What's the rental income going to be? You know, we are going to pull credit on you, but we don't care about DTI. D DSCR does not care about DTI. We don't look at all or anything else on your credit report. We want to know where your mortgage is paid on time. What's your credit score? Yes, if you have like charge offs and stuff, that is going to affect a DSCR lender. There are certain lenders that will not do that. They're going to make you pay it off. So your personal loan matter. Your your personal credit matters. Credit score, yes. Mortgage is paid on time, yes. And yes, if you have any charge offs. It's a misconception that, so I've heard it a lot lately. People think you don't pull credit on these DSCR loans. We do pull credit. There is a personal guarantor. We, we can go down to a 575 credit score. I have one lender that goes down to 575. Most of them are gonna start at 660, 680 FICO, but I have some that I go at 620. 640. There's different things we can do for investors that, you know, have credit scores that are below a 575. You can, if, if you don't mind having somebody yeah, I, else I, run on the loan, they, you can have a joint LLC together. Then there's also, you have to make sure you're going to a lender that only allows one member to be on the loan. There's a lot of particulars with lenders and the differences, but first, let me just talk about the loan a little bit. So there's no income, no employment on this loan. So you could be retired and get into this loan. We don't care about what you make. We're not going to ask you about your tax returns. Have you filed your taxes? We don't care about any of that. We do pull credit. Like I said, um, some lenders will report to your personal credit. Some of them won't. So that's something that you want to make sure if it's an issue, you want to make sure you're covering that up front to get to the right, the right lender. All of these loans require reserves. So any investment property that you buy, whether it's conventional loan or DSCR loan, you're gonna have to have reserves. Typically it's gonna be three or six months of reserves. So that's your PITI HOA payment that you'll need in reserves. Some lenders, if you're doing a refinance, will allow, and you're doing a cash out, they'll allow you to use your, the cash out proceeds as reserves. This is going to be a typical 20% down on a purchase, like a conventional loan or 15. I have two lenders that will allow 15% down on this loan. On a cash out refinance, 75% is going to be typically your max loan to value. I have one lender that will go to 80%. You do need a 720 credit score on a rate and term, 80%. Another misconception is the, the type of uh, term on these loans. They are typically 30-year fixed principal and interest loans. You can get 40-year AMS. We have interest only. We have ARMS. But typically, my investors just get in a 30-year fixed P&I loans. Liz, I, I, I have a question. You're talking about your investors and the, the places people can get these loans. When, when one is looking for a DSCR loan, is there like obvious thing for the new investors? And this is a topic somewhat new to me. I mean, is there in the yellow pages? I mean, do we go to Google? Uh, do, does our bank have DSCR loans? Is there companies that specialize in this? How does one go about finding the, is someone like yourself directs them to different companies? How does one go about finding a DSCR loan? So, I mean, I'm a loan officer. So whether you go to a Wells Fargo, a Chase, or you come to me, we're all the same. You're going to pay okay. a loan officer there. You're going to pay me just like you're going to pay a loan officer there. I'm literally, but I'm not, I don't have one lender. I don't have just Wells Fargo's guidelines and one lender to go to. I have over 60 of these lenders because I'm a mortgage broker. So I, I am going to pick, well, I'm going to direct you to, to go to the correct lender based on your circumstance. 
Every lender has different credit score requirement, a different DSCR ratio requirement, minimum loan amount requirement. I have one lender that has no minimum loan amount. All my other wow. lenders start at, I have one at 50, I have a few at 75, then they go to 100, 125, 150. There's some at 200, some at 300. So you have to make sure you're going to the right lender. We talked about the income piece. Some lenders allow long-term rents. Others will do the short-term rental pieces. Excuse me, short-term rental income. I have one lender that'll actually do pad split, but you have to have a history of having pad splits before. Pad splits, most lenders don't even really know about them right now. They don't even know what they are. Uh, but I do have the one lender that's that's breaking into doing pad splits. Seasoning requirements, cash out refi seasoning. I have one lender that'll do it one day out. Some other lenders are three months. Most of them are gonna be six months. Some of them are 12. If you've had your property listed on the MLS, some, some lenders are gonna make you wait six months before you can refi. Some lenders are okay with one day off the MLS. And yes, your property cannot be listed to get this loan because you're, you're saying you're gonna get a refinance has to be taken off the market. Nested LLCs, that's been a big one that's coming up, came up lately. A lot of my sub two peeps were taught to have a holding company, have your LLCs underneath there. There's lenders, some lenders don't allow for nested LLCs. They want you to be the, the, the owner of the LLC. They don't want another LLC owning the LLC or a trust owning an LLC and an LLC. Foreign nationals, manufactured homes, rural properties. I can do them all, but only certain lenders. Mortgage lates. I do have some lenders that'll, that'll lend with a one times 30. I have one with a two times 30. Others will not allow any lates. A gift of equity. If you're buying from a family member, I have some lenders that'll allow you to do 100% gift of equity. You don't have to come out of pocket at all on that purchase if you're purchasing it from a family member. I mentioned before the LLC piece. So if you're buying it in an LLC, and yes, DSCR, you can buy it as an individual or you can buy it in an LLC. If you're buying it in an LLC, some lenders want all members of the LLC to be on the loan. Some lenders allow one member. Some lenders, it's 25% or more. So these loans are not cookie cutter. They're not like a straight conventional loan. You can go to any bank and pretty much get the same set of guidelines. It's all over the place with these guidelines. Um, first time home buyer, First time investor, I have some lenders that will allow the, that other lenders won't. Appraisal transfers, most lenders. So that's kind of the good thing with these. A lot, if you have a unique property, you're not really sure where the value is going to come in. I recommend that we order your appraisal up front. Let's get the value and then we'll figure out what lender we're going to send it to. Oh, wow. It makes a lot of sense. You got some great nuggets there. I know people are going to be scrolling back on the YouTube video. To, Let me get that. Let me get that. No, perfect. Perfect. Hey, we got a couple of questions here. Let's bring a couple of folks on. Uh, Sean LeBaron, you're on with Liz Lopez. What's your question? Hi, Liz. We hey, connected Sean. through Facebook as far as Messenger. So I had you on my list to talk to. So this was perfect timing. Some of the question I have, you kind of answered, but I'll just tell you my scenario so that you can give me the, the answer. So I've got one property. I bought it as a um, fix and flip about a little over two months ago. So I'm just finishing up. Um, I put it out for sale by owner just to test the water, see what I get. And of course, I get a lot of people that are interested in lease options. Um, if I decided to go the lease option route, then I would have to do a refinance because the existing loan I have is a, you know, a one year fix it construction type loan. Um, if I did that, I've got over 680. I've got an S Corp with one other person in it. Uh, so I just like to know my options as far as that goes. Um, looking for cash out. Um, and looking for, you know, as low a rates as I can get. If you can give me an idea of what the rates probable range would be, then I could figure out what their payment would have to be on the lease option in order to cover either a 1.25, um, or a 1%, depending on what you're looking for. So that's just kind of where I'm at. Well, I could price a loan out with you right now, if you wanted, or I can mm -hmm. just tell you it's probably going to be in the eights. Okay, eight, eight was summer. what I was kind of using in my head, but I thought I'd check and just see, you know, am I still on track? Yeah, so. I, mean, I price many of these loans out daily. Um, yeah. I, I can tell you your loan's probably going to be in the eights, but I okay. want more I'll... of a definitive answer. 
I could price it out with you right now. Right. No, that gives me what I'm looking for. Cause then I can calculate out, you know, I know what they're talking about for down payment. So I just need to figure out, you know, if I figure out what my payment's going to be at 8%, then I can figure out what their payment needs to be on this lease option. If I have what I have, I'm going to put in the chat. I have a DSCR inquiry form. It's a short job form. It's like 10 questions, credit score, property address, taxes, insurance, market rent. Um, when did you purchase the property? property value. If you fill that Perfect. out, it comes to me and my assistant and I can get you pricing um, within hours. Okay. And then um, the next question is just has to do, you mentioned mobile homes. So you do mobile home on land. Yeah. Um, I guess the question is, that, you know, the, in, in, especially in Tennessee, there's two types of mobile home on land out here. Some are on the uh, fixation to permanency and some are not. So, um, you know, Perfectly, when they're not, generally they don't... Fixed. Permanently fixed. permanently fixed. Okay. Built after 1976, just like right. a like a conventional. Right. So home. it would be the same as conventional. Correct. Okay. And then yeah. what uh, what about the rates on those in general? They're going to be probably about a point point and a half higher okay. than, than a regular single family. You're going to be limited on your loan to value, 70 percent on a purchase, sixty five on a on a refinance. Okay. And then going back to my first one, and that's my last question. I forgot to ask what what was the um, the cash out percentage. 75. 75. All on right. A sing, on a single family with a 680 credit score. When you Great. go, when you start getting into multi units, now they're, they're going to start limiting. You might be a fourplex, will probably be 70%. And also depends on the lender. And if if you had over a 720, you could get 80% cash up on a single family. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Adam Catledge, you are on with Liz Lopez. We got you the bag of money. What's your, what's your question? Hey, hey, Liz. Um, I know that I don't. I was on a call when you first came on, so you may have addressed it. But um, I know that for a lot of the que the price people in the question are going to ask this question, but I know that some of people won't ask. Um, but when you're buying in for you know, I guess refinancing out of a sub two loan or a hybrid, um, because we just did that, so we've gone through the process, and so we know what it is. But a lot of people don't. Can you cover some of that? Because like for us. We had no idea that it might have been beneficial for us to get when we signed the documents the first for the closing on the sub two loan that maybe we should have had reached out to the lender and got the original note because we couldn't it was hard to get because our name's not on the loan and so on so can you cover some of those things for the people because there are a lot of sub two people in here um just so that they can that's one of our checklist items now when we go to get a sub two we want that original note from the seller um, so that when we go to refinance in a few years, we have that and we don't have to worry about searching for it. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so we do care about the payment history on the subject property. We will need a, a 12 month history or however many months you have of the history. So we are gonna need the original note. The underwriter will question it, but I've, I've, I've refinanced sub twos. So it's not an issue, but you definitely need the documentation. Um, another thing I didn't mention was um, your primary residence. We're going to need payment history on your primary residence with most of these lenders. If you rent, we're going to need a verification of rent. If you live rent free, might be an issue. There's only some lenders that allow you to live rent free. Most of them want to have a primary housing expense. You definitely want the copy of the note. You want to be able to access, you know, the the payment history on it. And are there any other things that would be that you've seen? that would hold up a refinance of a sub two loan or a, a, let's say a hybrid, say you've got your private money partner on the back on the, as a third position or a fourth position. Um, you know, are there anything you would have that you see that would hold up those types of transaction refine, refine into DSCR products? I mean, we'll need payoffs and payment histories. Okay. And then copies of the notes. I appreciate it. Yeah. Gail Henry, you're on with Liz Lopez. What's your question? Yeah, Liz, um, I think I kind of heard you say that you could actually put the note in the name of a business, but there's extra hoops. Uh, could, could you go through those hoops? Are you talking about LLC? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yes, um, they allow you to purchase it in LLC. When you're purchasing it in an LLC, some lenders will report to your credit and some of them won't. 
depending on how many members are in the LLC and what lender you're going to. Some lenders will make all members of the LLC be on the loan. Some lenders will allow just one member to be on the loan. And some lenders, it depends on the percentage of uh, your, your ownership. Oh, they're all closely held. So just me and my wife. If it's nested entity, there's only certain lenders that will allow that layered or nested entities. Um, no, none of them are really nested. They I probably should, but I have not. <laughs> it's very, it's very typical to buy these homes in an LLC. Okay. Okay. So it's not really as hard as it sounds. It's just a uh, little extra. You just have to make sure you're going, we're going to the right lender, depending on your circumstance. Jason Merritt, you're on Liz Lopez. What's your question? Hey guys, how you doing? Appreciate you uh, doing this, Liz uh, and JJ. It's awesome. Uh, so I have a question uh, regarding the DSCR loans. Do they allow uh, for any type of seller seconds, any of them? I have one lender that does. You do? Awesome. Yes. They go up to 50% on the first lien. They'll allow a seller finance second up to 90% CLTV. So they'll allow 40% seller finance second. And you bring 10% down. Okay. If, it, if it's a multi-unit over five units, this particular lender will actually go up to uh, is it 70 or 75? 70% on the first lien with the seller finance 15% second and then 10% down. Okay. And then like on a uh, fixer upper where you get a tenant in place and then you refinance with the DFCR loan, uh, did you say that that was only 60%? As far as the LTV, the, the manufactured home that he was asking me about. Uh, okay, well, typically, what's uh, as long as your LTV is, uh, I mean, say 80 percent, you're usually good to go on that. So cash out seventy five percent is the max with most lenders. However, I have one go to eighty if you have a seven twenty credit score. All right, cool. Sounds great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Welcome. Yeah, something else I didn't mention, not not particular, Jason. Um, lease agreements. Most of these lenders are going to want to see that you have a lease agreement in place on a refinance. Some of them will allow you to do it if it's vacant property and you don't have it leased yet. And on a purchase, we're going to be ordering the regular appraisal and then we need the 1007 market rent analysis form, which is an additional form that the appraiser completes. It is an additional cost. It's the same whether you're going conventional or DSCR, you're going to need that additional form. That is going to tell us what the market rent is on that property. So on a purchase, that's what we're going to use for the rents. Unless there's a lease in place, we can look at the lease. Some lenders will allow us to use the lease over the market rent, only if it's like a, a, up to 120% more. Other lenders are going to use the lower of the two. When you are doing a purchase or refinance, you want to specify if you need short-term rental comps. Appraisers are not used to doing short-term rental comps on a mark, the market rent 1007. So you definitely have to specify that up front. If you have comps that we could provide just to show him, it would be op optimal to do that, especially with short-term rentals. It's an issue getting these appraisers to put short-term rental comps on the appraisals. Um, it's, it's hard for them to find the data. Liz, you are amazing. I'm loving this. I'm loving this. We got a couple more questions popping in here. Harry Jot, you are on with Liz Lopez. What's your question? Yeah, question is, um, you mentioned somewhere in there the, the different ways to partner with people, and you mentioned something about uh, that a family, and I think, or friend, you said can share their equity, so that's that's not a HELOC. Like, what is that, and what liability does your family slash friend have in that? Yeah. Like, so how does that work? I've never heard of that. I've done a couple of loans. It's called a gift of equity. Normally, it would not be a loan. Gifts are not allowed on investment properties and for, with conventional loans. But with the DSCR, I have lenders, some lenders that allow gifts of equity. So if you're buying it from a family member, instead of having to come up with a down payment, the family member gifts the down payment to you, called a gift of equity. And do they have to take it out? Like it's a little, it's, it's similar to a, a refi for them? Happens at, at closing. So they, they sign a gift letter and at closing, it's just, it's transferred in escrow. Their equity, because instead of them getting the money back, 
it's just transferred over and you're using it as your down payment. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Randy, you're on with Liz Lopez. What's your question? Hello, everyone. Okay. So my scenario is you mentioned that you have a lender who does um, pass split. My pass split is different in that I have 12 month leases on my room. So, um, how would your uh, lender feel about that and how do they look at that rent considering so the fact that I have? Are you renting by the room and you have long-term leases? That's different. Correct. That's different than a pad split. And I have some other lenders that will actually allow that. Not a lot, a lot of them will, but I have a couple that allow that. So we would use That's the long-term leases for your market rent. Okay. Um, and I just started that model in May of last year. Do I have to have like a 12 month tenure of doing that or something? No, not for that scenario. For the pad split, yes, but not for that scenario. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, JJ. Thank you, Randy. Thank you for the great question. Good to see you again. Rafael Pedroso, you are on with Liz Lopez. What's your question? Hi, Liz. Thank you. Um, my question is that this, can you do a DSCR on a Section 8? Yes. So, yeah, you would, you would be getting long-term a lease agreement. So, yes. Okay, perfect. And then if I do have that nested LLC, should I start looking to get a different one for, for the next properties or? You don't need to. You just need to specify when you're talking to your loan officer that you have a nested LLC. Okay. Oh, well, that'll be you. One, uh, awesome. Yeah. Schedule a call. One thing you guys want to be careful when you're talking to loan officers and they tell you, no, you can't do that. You need a 620 credit score. You need a 1.25. It's probably because... They only have their one, they only work for one lender. So they only have one set of guidelines so they can go off of. These loans are business purpose, non-QM loans, and some of these lenders do not require licensing. So you could be working with anybody that's just saying they want to do it, they want to sell DSCR loans. Also something that you want to be careful because you're going to think you can't get a loan or, and I hear horror stories every day of people loan officer tell them one thing and then they get into underwriting and they can't do it and you really have to vet out who you're working with okay matt van Met meter you are on with liz lopez what's your question matt awesome awesome thanks guys thanks liz um so i have a question about dti so um you you mentioned that you know a lot of these programs uh, require individuals to be you know on the loan or at least guaranteed the loan can you talk a little bit about dti and the impact of dti um with the dscr loans no DTI. Okay. That's what I was hoping to hear. No DTI. <laughs> we don't care about all the debts on your credit report. We're not going to add anything up on there. We just care if you have a charge off and are you paying your, your mortgage on time and what's your FICO? What's your credit score? Hey, Matt, thanks for joining us. Uh, great question. Jeffrey English, you are on with Liz Lopez. What's your question? Yes. Hi, Liz. How are you? Hey, Jeffrey. Awesome. Good. Um, so I have a question. You said nested LLCs. Um, how about series LLCs? Do lenders have a problem with series LLCs? Like, cause I'm buying some properties in Alabama, uh, section eight specifically. And I have a series LLC that I basically put each property in under a parent LLC. I've never heard the term series LLC. Can you, can you tell me exactly? So, what yeah. So there are a few States, I think 17 States in the United States that offer a series LLC, Texas being one of them, Alabama being another. What a series LLC allows you to do is take a parent LLC and then through an operating agreement, roll out cells of that parent. So when I put the property in the deed, well, the name on the deed should be the name of the parent LLC, a series of, or I should say, I'll, I'll let me give you an example. One, two, three Main Street, a series of, then the LLC name. Okay. And what that does is it allows you to create individual cells underneath that that series LLC. So it gives you the protection of each individual um, cell separate from all of them. It allows you basically to roll out LLCs at a almost no cost, okay? Texas does it a lot, uh, Alabama does it, just actually Alabama just rolled that out. Um, so it can create some problems um, if you don't do it properly. But if you structure it okay, if, as far as the naming is concerned, you shouldn't have any problem. When you say sell, are you talking about properties? No, I'm talking about actually that's the technical name of what the series is. Okay, so 
you can almost think of it, I don't want to say it's a parent-child relationship, but it is, okay? this The parent LLC is the main LLC. That's the one that gets registered with the Secretary of the State, okay? And then what you do is you create a separate operating agreement for each one of the series, and it allows you to essentially create these other series at no additional cost, <clears throat> okay? So it's fairly straightforward. I do it in Texas a bunch, um, and uh, we do it uh, in Alabama as well. I would but like I'm just wondering see, how difficult the lenders are going to have with that. I would like to see a copy of one of your LLCs, if you don't mind. Off Absolutely. This call. If it's an LLC with you as the member and you're the owner and it's in the verbiage of the operating agreement about the series, it's probably not going to make a difference at all. Yeah, well, I kind of complicated a little bit by putting some privacy in there. I have my series held by a holding company, uh, kind of the Paceway, right? Yeah, so, then you got the nested LLC on top of that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I put some layers in there for, for obvious reasons. Yeah. Or maybe, yeah, maybe not so obvious, but uh, the bottom line is I do that for a reason. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a concern of mine, obviously, before I go too far into, you know, elaborating on that series and trying to uh, DSC our loan out of that. Because my ultimate goal is to basically have cash out refinance on all those properties so I can essentially do the burn method, right? Just mm -hmm. constantly rinse and repeating here. Um, all right, well, I did have one other question and I actually, I think we talked real briefly over Instant Messenger on it um, about self-directed IRAs and doing a non-recourse uh, DSCR loan on a self-directed IRA. Mm -hmm. So normally self-directed IRAs, you're actually buying the property with your IRA, you're paying the mortgage to the yep. IRA, you're paying the rental income to the IRA. So you're not even involving a mortgage. You're Correct. using your IRA to purchase the property. Yep. Now, if you're using the IRA funds for like down payment, then we could use a DSCR loan and you'd be using some of your IRA or your IRA funds to purchase the, the property sure. with your down payment. But if you're actually buying it in your IRA, you wouldn't need a DSCR loan. Correct, but what I'd like to do OK, because I run the numbers and if I can leverage in the self-directed or solo 401k IRA that I have, um, I buy it in that with all cash using the funds from the uh, solo 401k. OK, and the goal here is to then basically DSCR loan, stabilize it, right? Get get a tenant in place, stabilize it and then use a self-directed IRA. Um, I'm sorry, a, um, a um, DSCR loan to take the money out to then redeploy that money. Okay, so essentially I'm creating leverage instead of say a, a return, cash on cash return of 10 or 12%, I can make that 24 to 30% pretty easily by doing that. Um, so the bottom line is within my solo 401k, there are some rules and you can do it. I was just wondering if you have any experience with lenders that will allow you to do it because the guys at KKOS, um, which is um, Pace's lawyer as well, one of his lawyers, <coughs> excuse me, they said, absolutely, you can do it. You just have to do it with a non-recourse loan, basically meaning that they can't come after me. They can go after the property, but they can't come after me. That's just a rule that the IRS has on solo 401ks. So yes, um, there are some non-recourse DSCR lenders that won't report okay. to your credit. Okay, good. So yes, we well, could refinance out. We would just have to use one of those lenders. All right. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Jeffrey. Great question. Thank you so much. Liz, man, you are just like a <laughs> vault of knowledge. Um, great topic. Great topic. I love this. I love talking about mortgages. Yeah, um, no. I, I think we've had more questions on your call than anybody else. <laughs> Something else I want to mention. Um, so, a lot of the DSCR lenders, you know, I mentioned that some of them don't require you to be licensed. Some of them do require you to be licensed. When the ones that don't require you to be licensed, a lot of them don't send out disclosures. So you're not going to, you want to make sure your loan officer is letting you know what your interest rate is, you know, how much is it going to cost, because you're not going to get any initial disclosures with a lot of those lenders. You're only going to see the final, the CD when it's ready and then sign your final loan docs. Now, when you say, don't have to be licensed who doesn't have to be licensed the person getting the loan or the person who getting the loan from 
So certain states require you to be licensed, but a lot of states don't require a license to do a DSCR loan. Now, certain DSCR lenders require you to be licensed. Like the ones that give me the best interest rates, they require a mortgage license. My my question really is um, trying to understand the license thing is that if I want to get a loan, one of these DSCR loans in certain states, I have to be licensed? The loan officer. The loan, that's what I was trying to clarify. Like they, have to, one, they have to be licensed. So uh, when one is going to get DRC, DSCR loans, sometimes these people are licensed and sometimes they're not. And can someone that doesn't have a license provide this kind of a loan? Yes. Okay. Is that rare or is that common? I guess it depends on the uh, state, It's right? probably more rare than common because if you're working with somebody who's not licensed and they're not seasoned, I mean, you're going to easily be able to tell. Yeah. I mean, it, it just seems to me that if you're dealing with money and properties and loans and legal documents, that this person should be licensed. It just, it, to me, that just makes sense. You won't get the best interest rates and probably the best lender particular circumstance if you're working with somebody that's not licensed. You know, I, I, let me ask you, you, you've been doing this for a minute, as you say, a um, couple minutes, maybe. Um, if someone's looking to get into this kind of work, I mean, obviously you started a long time ago in this industry of, of mortgages. Is this something that you got to get into early and, and pay your dues? Is this something someone can get into later on? I mean, or is this is this an industry that we as investors are just dealing with and it's a resource we need to be aware of? Uh, are you talking about being a mortgage professional, a loan officer? Well, yeah, and, you know, I mean, what you're doing sounds really interesting. Some people might have the kind of aptitude where that fits their wheelhouse. I can tell you, your first few years of being in the mortgage industry, it's extremely tough. You have to have thick skin to last in this business. My job is extremely stressful. There's there's things that happen in loans I have no control over all the time, all the time. And you got to be able to make make those phone calls to those clients and give the bad news and brush it off your shoulder and walk away. Um, you're going to get beat up in this business in the first few years, especially. It's not easy, but yeah, I mean, you, you have to take a test. You have, yes, you have to be licensed to be a loan officer. You have to take a federal test and a state test. Um, but the DFCR product, there are certain lenders that don't require licensing. But to do any other loan, you have to have a mortgage license. You know, doing DSCR, I imagine you do them in multiple states, right? Not just one state. Nationwide, yeah. So many of those states require a license? No, just the, like five or six of them require a license. Okay. And as you were, you know, coming up, this does not seem like an easy industry. And as you said, the, the first few years are brutal. Uh, did you have a particular mentor or someone that paved the way for you or really influenced you, just just was kind of there to support you along the way? Um, were there one or two people that, that really helped blaze that trail for you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's been many, many mentors of mine. Yeah, I, I started as a loan officer in 2005, and and it was good at that time, you know, selling those PICAM, NEGAM loans, MENA loans. Then the market went down. Um, and then, it, you know, you can really tell if you're going to stick in this business when the market goes down. Because when rates are high or low, excuse me, it's easy to be a loan officer. But when rates are high, it's not easy. Yeah. Trying to get the business. I don't have to get the business. I have people coming to me daily, but most loan officers, they're struggling right now. You know, I always talk, in, you know, as far as networking, and that's my thing, about the importance of building our network before we need it. Build those relationships before we need them. Uh, is this the same thing when investors are dealing with loans and, and maybe, you know, people in your industry? Is it is Do you find that, that it's advantageous for the investor to maybe we, we got you know 30 40 people in the car right now is it beneficial for them to reach out to you and get to know you up front or people watching on youtube later weeks and months down the line for any investor you know you know pace talks about we have to build our team we we, we need uh an escrow officer we need a title company we need a real estate attorney we need the contractor 
Is it advantageous that we have in line as we're building these relationships to build a relationship with a professional, someone like yourself? Absolutely. I love talking to people. I do it all day long. I'm on phone calls with investors. I mainly work with investors. 90% of my loans are DSCR. I, I have other people that come to me for full doc loans, but I mean, I prefer the DSCR. I, I underwrote income for so many years and I don't mind doing it every now and then, but I don't want to look at tax returns every day. Um, it's easy to turn and burn these loans when I'm doing the same loan product and I'm pricing them out every day with all different lenders and I, I know where to go. I don't have to, where am I doing? What am I doing this? You know, I know where to go for these loans depending on the people's circumstance. That's so, so fantastic. Please, out, please, please schedule a call. Um, I love to talk to people. I love meeting people. If you're here in Arizona, let's connect. Kate, you're back on with Liz Lopez. What's your question? Liz, what is your dream loan? What is a clean cut, awesome loan? What do you want to loan on? 780 credit score, <laughs> um, single family home, cash flows nicely. That you have the equity in there, you know that the value is going to come in. We know what the market rent is. You don't have nested LLCs. You don't have a bunch of large deposits in your bank statements because these loans, like I said, they do require reserves. Some lenders are going to look at your bank statement and look at the large deposits like a full doc loan. They're going to want to season and I mean they're going to source, excuse me, any large deposits. Your down payment, they're going to want it seasoned. There's other DSCR lenders that don't care. There's some that are go back 10 days to look at your bank statement. Some of them don't care where the funds to close come from. So when I help a newbie, I guess what I'm asking is, what do you tell them they want to have in order for getting a DSCR loan? Uh, some lenders, like I said, aren't going to care where the money's coming from. So you just want to make sure you're going to the right lender. So they have to have the down payment, the credit score, the property that they're buying. Does it cash flow? Is it rented out right now? Is there a lease agreement? So to present this, it is better to show the existing leases. And when you say a private money lender, you want the private money lender to put the money in that person's account or can they just tell you this is your private money lender but we're going to have to see the funds we're going to have the, the lender writer is going to have to make sure they have the money we can't just say it's coming from somebody else and then it just goes there at closing although i do have a couple lenders that aren't going to see the, they're not going to want to know where the funds are coming from they're going to want to okay. just see that the person has them i'm sorry that i interrupted you before i just my brain just goes all over the place. But I guess what I'm saying is when you bring a private money lender in to present a DCSR loan, if they are going to, the private money lender is going to be your down payment. Do you need to have them in your bank account or is it okay to present that they are the private money lender and what kind of document do you provide? We typically don't have private money lenders for bringing the down payment on these loans. Most of the lenders are going to want to see it's in your bank account. Some of them are going to want to see it's seasoned in there for a certain amount of time. There are a couple of lenders who won't ask where the funds are coming from. At that, in those, with those lenders, you could use a PML. Let me ask you: How is the PML protecting themselves? Are they part of the LLC? Are they putting a second lien on the property? Because that's going to be an issue. We can't have another lien recorded at the same time. Going back to that property that I talked to you about earlier, I have a private money lender that's interested in putting what is necessary, so long as it's covered, by what the income is. Are they going to be in your LLC? They just wanted to be repaid with the facts that this is going to cover the loan. Do I need to make them part of the LLC? That's what I'm asking is what is the best way to present this? So you can say, oh, I have a money, a private money lender and they can send you a letter and they can say, I'm going to lend them this much or that's exactly, that's what I'm know. asking. I see your head nodding. <laughs> Talk to me. I, I think your scenario is 
more of a one-off scenario. It's not typical that people are buying investment properties and they're trying to use a private money lender for the down payment. It's typically not going to be allowed with most of these lenders. For your scenario, it's different. You're trying to do a blanket loan, short-term rental income. We have the PML. I'd say, let's take it off the call. Let's get all of the particulars and I can talk to some of my lenders about it with, with you. Oh, Thank huh. you, Kate. And, you know, I think you're, uh, you're going to benefit greatly by being able to get to know Liz and get on the phone, become friends. And, and, you know, I say it all the time, guys, don't chase the deal, chase the relationship. You know, I just know Liz to be smart and have a great personality. And and I just want to, and now knowing the value she brings, I mean, you know, I'm not going to chase the deal, but I'm just going to continue to build a strong friendship there because we want to surround ourselves with strong, successful people. The success of our business is predicated by the five or six people that we interact with the most. And we can make, and when, when those people can become people that bring value and knowledge and expertise like Liz Lopez, we're three steps ahead of the game. You know, Kate, the whole reason I do what I do is because when I started as an investor, I saw people that didn't even know how to use Facebook. And yet we're out here in education groups trying to learn to build our network and build our associations, but we need to know how to learn use Facebook. Yeah, I, I love educating people. You know, if you guys have questions, I, I am on the phone a lot, but text me. We'll make sure we set up a call. I, I am available for my clients my my friends my investors you know on the weekends and nights and whatever just text me i'll answer you um mortgages are complicated so i'm i'm i would love to be a resource and and be here for you guys oh liz you just bit off more than you can chew girl uh you know i want to learn more about mortgages and i've got so many people coming to me for help that i'd love to direct them to you but learn you know i direct people to those that can answer questions so I'd love to learn more. I've heard DSCR for the longest time and didn't know what it meant. I thought it meant like something related to like, you know, Disney credit or something, right? So, uh, you know, cause we, have, we have Disneyland in Southern California here. I'm an expert in all mortgages, but I just love the DSCR loan product. Good to know. Good to know. Hey, Liz, I got, I got two last questions for you before we head off. Um, one, if folks want to reach out to you, they want to connect with you because unbelievable value. Uh, what is the best way to get a hold of you? Would it be your your MySpace page, your TikTok? Do you have a website, uh, your Instagram? Yes. Yeah, so um, I'm putting my phone number. Well, my phone number is right there. <laughs> um, here's my email. I am on Facebook, Liz Lopez. I was Liz Lopez, the mortgage broker, until they made me take that off today. I'm going to maybe put that back on later. Um, I am on Instagram, DSCR Mortgage Gal. I'm on TikTok. DSCR Mortgage Gal. I'm heavy on Facebook, though. I don't post as much on the other sites, but I, I need to get more into that. And what, one thing I'd recommend to all my investors, make sure when you're buying these properties that you have an exit strategy. I have so many investors coming in here right now in hard money loans, and they didn't have an exit strategy. Now they're having trouble because it doesn't cash flow or the, the, doesn't, the value is not there or it just costs too much money. And so... Um, just do your research up front. Talk to me, you know, when you're going to buy a property and we can we can make sure we're putting everything together correctly. You know, and again, I, I always say this. We've got new folks on the call, new folks watching on the call. For those that aren't aware, what is an exit strategy? What are you going to do with the property when it's done? Well, how are you going to get out of this hard money loan? You got to think about that. So buy and hold, rent it, um, wholesale it, whatever it happens to be you know, how exiting out of the, the transaction that we've entered into is what an exit strategy is. And don't wait till the term is up. You know, come come talk to me or another professional before the term's up so you can make sure that you you might have to sell the property if they're if you're upside down in it. Yeah. So my, my last question to you before we head to the breakout rooms um, is, you know, my group's a networking group and I'm always talking about the importance of, of networking there are many real estate education groups out there right now that have a Facebook page for their community, encouraging, you know, brand new inexperienced investors and brand new experienced investors, meaning brand new to the education program. In many cases, brand new to social media using Facebook. Uh, for these people that are coming to these education platforms and now are, are using social media 
uh, what is the importance and value of networking to the success of their business, in your opinion? And, you know, what's the importance of possibly joining a group like mine to the success of their business? Oh, my gosh. Networking is everything. And creating relationships is is everything in this business. It doesn't matter what profession you're in, um, but especially being an investor and, and joining your group. I mean, you have a huge amount of uh, information and speakers that you bring on and, and you're always offering value. So I'd highly recommend for people to join your group. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So hey, if you guys are watching on YouTube right now, uh, please like Liz's video. Please put in the comment section what your takeaways were, what you found important, valuable, uh, maybe how we can improve a, a little bit for the future. If you're on the call right now, guys, don't go away. We're about to run to some breakout rooms, do some live networking. Again, if you want to get a hold of Liz, it's easy Lopez at nexamortgage.com she's also on facebook can't get a hold of her get a hold of me i'll make sure i plug you in with liz thank you guys for you've been on the call today we really appreciate you uh please come back again we've got more great speakers coming up in the future and um liz i guess we'll just continue to see them you know, on facebook and instagram and through social media so everybody else please uh please come back for more and we'll see you guys out in the social media world Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. you.